Okay, this is um, Humanities 2, lecture number 3. Um, we're we're going to skip ahead a little bit. We're going to go to chapter 30. I think I, I mentioned that in the readings for this week. Um, and I want to uh, talk about the Industrial Revolution and uh, the kind of world that we, we are beginning to uh, move into that's very closely connected to our own time. We're getting closer and closer to our, our present day. Uh, and as that happens, we're going to have to really start skipping around a lot. We don't have very much time left in the semester, for one thing. Um, and we, we got set back quite a bit by the situation with this, this virus. Um, I do have one student now who has it. Um, if you do, you need to let me know. So we can, um, we can make uh, uh, arrangements to help get through the semester. Um, the problem is that as we go forward, there's just more and more people in the world. Population growth is increasing exponentially, which means there's a lot more people to do things. Um, when we began this uh, class, we had Baroque, right, and classical art, and not much else. Uh, but there were also a lot fewer people. And um, as technology has increased, communications increased, um, human population has increased, there's just so much more out there. So we have to um, I could fill a humanities textbook completely up with just the stuff from the last 10 years. Um, so we're going to have to be selective. Um, and, and one of the things I, I want you to draw from this class is I can't teach everything. There's no way. Uh, but I hope I give, I give us the capacity to learn stuff on our own, right? To explore um, other aspects of culture, perhaps, as you, as you go forward in your lives. And uh, be able to think critically about what you discover or what interests you. Um, and so that, that's just going to be a factor as we move on. And, and I, I'll illustrate that this way. Um, think about a, a radio disc jockey in 1953, for instance. Um, how many recording artists would that person have to choose from to decide what to play on the radio? And then contrast that with today. Same job, disc jockey radio, how many more artists are there out there to choose from? It's overwhelming and um, becoming more so every single day. Um, and so uh, this is the dilemma that humanity's courses face every time we get to this point in history. Um, but this particular moment of the Industrial Revolution is, is interesting, and I think that um, what your book doesn't say, and what I can do here uh, to add or to, to um, uh, lay a better background for this event um, is, I, I think, really significant. Uh, you can't understand the Industrial Revolution unless you understand the economy of the Middle Ages. Uh, when Europe was united under Christianity before the Reformation, uh, when the only church there was was the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church with the Pope in Rome. Um, the humanity had solved, well, humanity, European humanity had solved a basic problem in human existence. And they were the only culture that solved this problem up to that point. And the problem is, how does the work of the world get done? The reality of slavery is a backdrop to everything we have studied up to this point. Well, in the humanities class in general, especially if we go, if you have my humanities one class, you go all the way back to prehistory. Slavery is a nearly universal fact of the human condition all the way up through um, the fall of Rome. Um, we're talking about thousands and thousands of years of human history. When you see things like you go back and study some of the ancient Greek philosophers, for instance, and Socrates is, you know, doing all these amazing things, and um, all these philosophers from ancient Greek are busy philosophizing and, and studying and understanding things. The only way that happens is on the backs of people who don't have a choice but to do the menial labor and the basic things that have to be done that aren't philosophizing and studying and so forth and so on. Um, slaves are how the world worked. 
And a person from that age couldn't really imagine a world without slaves. Uh, they would, if you tried to pose them a, a, a society that didn't have this, they would just throw up their arms and say, it can't work. Who's going to do the work? Um, who's going to free up um, all of our statesmen and our philosophers and our artists and all these people to do these amazing contributions to culture if, if these people are emptying out latrines and, and digging ditches? Right? We, the world work of the world has to be done. And slavery was the only way humanity got that done all the way up until the fall of Rome and, and for a while thereafter. Uh, what happens is in Europe, slavery gradually uh, ceases to exist. Uh, it doesn't have, this doesn't happen evenly. It happens more in some places, less in others. But you can look at the history of Christian Europe after the fall of Rome and see this long progression away from slavery. Uh, and this happened without any uh, major armed conflicts of any kind. Um, Europe didn't have a civil war about freeing slaves the way we, we had a civil war in the United States. Uh, slavery just phased itself out. Uh, and the reason for that is that Christianity, uh, the basic principles that underlie Christianity, just can't tolerate slavery. Um, Jesus died the death of a slave. Uh, he, he, when you say that the creator of the universe, the, the person responsible for the salvation of every soul, if that's what you believe, and all of Christian Europe believed that, right? if, if he was a servant, if he died this ignoble death, uh, the, the, the fact of the crucifixion uh, levels the playing field. Because in Christianity, the king needs salvation just as much as the lowest servant needs salvation. And, and Christ's sacrifice, this, this uh, earth-shattering uh, act of, of self-sacrifice, was for everyone, kings and slaves. And when you accept that psychologically, you can't look at slaves the same way anymore. They can't be just, just the backdrop, right? They can't be the part of the furniture. They're people for whom Christ died, just like their owners. And that changes things. That is a psychological shift that uh, the shape of the medieval mind was different from the shape of the mind of ancient Rome and ancient Greece and ancient everywhere. Um, because of this, because of this, this, this change in point of view, the cross is so high above everyone that from that vantage point, everything's level down below. And what you have is this gradual transition from slavery to serfdom to peasanthood. And, and, and along this process, your average laboring person gains more and more autonomy and more and more uh, dignity. Um, in the beginning, what would happen is a kind of a, a serfdom is a kind of of, um, of arrangement between the uh, powerful interests in an area and the menial laborers, and your your nobility or your aristocracy or whoever it was that owned that land uh, would would say, okay, you can have this. Uh, the serfs can you can have this land, and your job is to till it to maintain it. Uh, to uh, bring its produce forth, and uh, I, as the as the uh, patron of this area, if I'm the ruler uh, or the nobleman or the person that's in charge there, um, I will take a, a percentage of that. I'll take some of the proceeds, but the rest is for you. Uh, and and in that relationship, the ruler owed something to the ruled, and the ruled owed something back to that person which is very different from slavery, which is do as I say, because I can kill you on a whim and no one will say anything to me about it. That's a, and, 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 and as time goes by, that relationship becomes more and more a position of freedom on the side of the manual laborer. And this symbiotic kind of relationship between ruled and, and, and ruler uh, and the way that an economy developed around that 
became an economy without slaves. Um, the guilds were formed, the trade guilds. Um, and these were groups of people who got together who were unified in a particular kind of, of work, whether they were smiths, right? We own many of our last names. Uh, come from these guilds. The smiths were the people who worked the forge, right? the masons, the people who worked in stone. They formed these guilds, these organizations, uh, and the guild, it had a way for people to advance and for anybody who was able-bodied to make a, a living. Uh, if you, you would simply pick a trade, say you're at your stage in life right now, right? This is that younger in the Middle Ages, but you're in a place right now where you don't know what you're going to be doing, many of you. Um, you're trying to decide, what do I want to learn? Um, where do I want to apply my skills? What kind of job do I want to have? Well, in, the, in, the, in Christendom, in Europe under Christianity, you would simply apply to be an apprentice in one of the, one of the guilds. And it would begin in this way. You, you would be uh, uh, in charge of assisting someone who was better at this than you. There were three levels in the guilds. You had your, your uh, apprentice, your journeyman, and your master's. And we still get words like masterpiece from this uh, arrangement. Uh, the word mister as a, as a, uh, a sign of respect, Mr. So-and-so, right? That's just a permutation of the word master. And it comes from the Middle Ages. And so your master in this guild was, was in charge of making masterpieces. And uh, they were the most skilled at what they did. It was a meritocracy. The more skilled you were, the further you could uh, rise in the guild. Down the bottom of this scale, the, the, um, the apprentice, their job was to help the journeyman and help the master. And, and in the process of doing this, learn the trade. And then there were uh, ways of advancement. If you got good enough as an apprentice, you could graduate to journeyman. And you could then move on to master. And if you couldn't, even if you couldn't, let's say you just did not have the capacity to rise above an apprentice, you still had at least room and board. They'd put a roof over your head and feed you. And you would have labor to do. You would have a job to do each day. And this was available to everybody. Um, the other thing that the Middle Ages did was a, a, a kind of a, a egalitarianism in um, education. So if you don't want to be a laborer and you don't want to work in one of the guilds, you could become an educated person in a great many areas had their own scholarships, had their ways of promoting people. You've got a bright young lad who wants to go do some book learning, well, we'll, we'll sponsor you. And, and the, the um, institution primarily, almost universally responsible for that was the church. And so most of these major churches and cathedrals had universities that built, were built up around them. And this is where you would go to study and learn things. Uh, once again, this was available to most people if they had the talent to do it. So there was an avenue of advancement and a way to um, uh, make a living and keep body and soul together uh, for everybody in medieval culture. Uh, now, there's a lot of horrible things about the Dark Ages. The Black Death, right? Not understanding hygiene and germ theory and all kinds of stuff, right? But that problem didn't exist. How do we get the world's work done? How do we keep people fed and clothed and sheltered? They solved that problem. Um, for those that were the absolute destitute, the people who were mentally handicapped or physically handicapped or there was some circumstance, the church provided uh, sustenance for them. Uh, everywhere in Europe, we had this, this thing, right? There is, this is before the Reformation. So the church, the Roman Catholic Church, owns enormous estates and land and materials and resources in all these different places in Europe. And uh, part of every monastery's job, for instance, monasteries where monks get together, right, and hang out, there's a, a place where they look, still have them around. Uh, but part of every monastery's job was to provide for those who were destitute. And so the tithes that came into the church, the people paying their tithes to keep up the church, a big percentage of that went directly to keeping, taking care of the people who were um, um, in, indigent and, and un, incapable of making a living. Uh, the, uh, the church also had enormous lands, which were called common land. Um, our, we get our word commoner from this, or that's just common, right? This, the common lands uh, were, were uh, good land, arable land, land you could grow stuff on, land you could hunt on, land that had uh, 
water, fresh water on it. Uh, uh, and at the very least, then this land was available to everybody. So this was set aside specifically for other for people to use in common. And if you were just absolutely destitute, you could go out there in the commons and fish and hunt for your food. Uh, you could grow a garden there. You could build a house there. Um, it's going to be temporary. but And so these temporary houses then became places where people just hung out. For, <laughs> that's where they lived. And, and, and this was um, the way that, that Christendom solved this problem. And the reason I have to use this as a backdrop is we've got to know uh, how the problem arises again. So the reformers in the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, who, who smashed Christendom apart and, and divided Christianity up into these all these different denominations, um, a great deal of impetus for that movement came from the nobility and the uh, monarchy of various places. And I'm going to use England as, a, as my primary example, but this thing kind of repeated itself throughout Europe. Um, Henry VIII was the king of England at the time of the Reformation. He wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon, who was his queen and his wife, um, and marry Anne Boleyn. The Pope said, no, I'm not annulling your marriage to Catherine of Aragon. It's a legitimate marriage. You can't just throw her aside like this. Uh, Henry decides to rebel and side with the Protestants because that's going to get him out from under the uh, yoke of Catholic Church. He will be able to divorce Catherine of Aragon and marry Anne Boleyn. And he latched onto a, a, an idea that was current during the Reformation of the divine right of kings. One of the arguments of the Reformers was that it wasn't the Pope who was supposed to be the head of the Church. It was the king of every nation that was supposed to be the head of the Church. So Henry, by siding with this idea, gets out from under the Pope's authority and become, he becomes the, the authority. So of course, He's going to annul his marriage and, and, and go ahead with what he wants to do. But, you know, then that was going to hear his personal impetus towards that move. But coinciding with that is that the church has all of this material, all of these resources, all of this land. They have tremendous wealth in England and everywhere else. And Henry got his nobility to back his move against the church by taking that stuff away from the church. Because remember now, Henry's the head of the church. He can do whatever he wants to do with what is his now. And he divides this stuff up with the nobility, with the people who backed him. He makes all of his friends and all the people who supported him uh, fabulously rich off of the church's property. Uh, and what they didn't realize they were laying an ax to was the tree of prosperity. <laughs> There's an extended metaphor that had sustained the Middle Ages without slavery, uh, because immediately these these no, noble people, the, the 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 aristocracy that Henry rewarded with the church's uh, uh, stuff, uh, stopped setting aside large portions of this for the poor and the indigent, stopped giving people um, uh, scholarships to attend their universities. They just took that for themselves, and they cut off from their uh, populace the means of support that people had relied on for centuries. Um, and it left these people with no route to go. Um, and this, this evolves and becomes more and more cruel as time goes by. And it reaches the height of its cruelty in the Industrial Revolution. The, indus the abuses of the Industrial Revolution are possible because of the loss of the charity of the church. The other thing that, that these new, uh, newly powerful uh, people did was they abolished the guilds because the guilds are a, are a check on their power. If you have a whole trade like the Masons, people who build in stone, united in this organization, they have tremendous power. <clears throat> what happens if they all stop deciding to make stone for you? Um, this was a affront to the new, uh, newly powerful uh, nobility in England and elsewhere. Um, and also, many of these guilds were very religious and in, in, um, very Catholic in their orientation. Each of the guilds would have had their own patron saint, for instance. Um, and uh, they saw themselves as existing under the authority of the church. 
And when you say, no, the church has no authority, the king has all this authority, the guilds have got to go, and they did. And that left, that cut off the other avenue. So the avenue towards for, for to be an educated person was cut off. The av avenue for the ordinary person to uh, who is who is uh, unable to make a living, the, the charity necessary for them was cut off. And then the uh, ability to make a living in any of the trades, it's just I'm going to start off as a, an apprentice and, and, and move my way up, that was cut off. And when the Industrial Revolution happens, all of these people who would have had their own their own cottage industries, right? Their, their own, if you were a mason, you'd be building stuff out of stone for people, right? These people are just out of work. And uh, people became, the, the poor got poorer and the rich got richer. And when the Industrial Revolution hits and suddenly you can have a machine that does the work of several men um, and you have no labor laws, no, no protection for anybody, uh, you end up with these nightmare factories that your book talks about and Charles Dickens describes in his works. Um, uh, these are brutal and, and um, um, the, the abuses are, 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 are unspeakable. Children being worked 15, 16, 20 hours a day. Uh, the, the law passed by Parliament to make things better, right? So it was worse than this before this law was passed. They finally got around to a little bit of legislation to protect people. And it, it said that um, you had every child, you couldn't, I think it was under nine. You couldn't, you couldn't put children to work in the factories under nine years old. That was better. That means that the factories had children that were younger than nine working in them. Um, that you had to uh, uh, give them two hours of education a day, right? Um, it's just brutal. And um, out of this comes a great deal of the horror that we associate with the 20th century um, in a very direct way. Uh, people were basically the world found a way to have slaves again, except uh, without calling them slaves. Uh, I'll give you some examples of some of the abuses. Um, besides the, you know, brutal long work days, the pay was next to nothing. And some places actually paid you with their own money. Um, the concept of a factory store was uh, invented at this time. And what you did was uh, you own the factory, right? And the workers have to work there. They're going to starve. Uh, and, and all the laws, the laws in, in England were, were lined up behind this. Um, the workhouses were places to put people who didn't have a job. Uh, and the workhouses were a kind of prison. And what you did was the worst manual labor possible. Breaking stones, picking oakum. Uh, picking oakum was taking the ropes from the from the ships. And this is where you know, we were using sails for the most part here, um, and tearing them apart with your hands to get the fibers out to use those fibers for something else. It was brutal work. Um, and once again, twenty hours a day. Uh, food's terrible, but they would literally lock you in what was called a workhouse if you didn't have a job. Um, um, that was considered charity. Uh, and then debtor's prisons, right? Uh, to get the logic behind this, you owe somebody something, you can't pay them, we're going to put you in prison until you can pay. Um, that's insane. Right? That just doesn't make any sense at all, except that it's cruel. Um, being indigent, having lacking means of support. So if you find somebody wandering around, the police, who, who, who lacked visible means of support, you're under arrest. You're going to the workhouse. Uh, so this forces people into these factories. They've got no other choice. Uh, and once again, there's no laws to protect them. And, and so some of these factories would they'd say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to make our own store. The store will be on our factory grounds, and it will have the basic necessities of life, nothing more. And we're going to pay our workers in our own money. This is the factory money, which isn't good anywhere except the factory store, which means these people are slaves. Everywhere else, everywhere in the world where you find slavery now, it's, it's like that. It's how it's done, that sort of thing. And it exists in other places for sure. Um, the fact is, most of our clothes were made. This I was, I came from Nike. I got it when I was coaching at OU. 
right earlier. Um, it was made by someone who's a de facto slave in, in somewhere in, in, in the third world. Um, uh, this is the way it's done. And uh, I, when I gave this lecture years ago, I had somebody bring me from a Whitewater a little wooden coin that they got paid at Whitewater with that they could use at Whitewater's uh, concession stand thing. And I'm like, you know that's illegal, right? That's like, we now have made laws against that kind of thing. Um, but it's, a, you know, people will give it a try. It looks great. We're going to maximize our profits. We're not going to pay people in actual money. We're going to pay them in our own money and make them use that at our own store. Um, and and it's, it's just horrible. So one of the things that arises out of this is the uh, advent of Marxism which I have said before is one of my most hateful ideas that I've ever experienced in my life. Uh, and I've had direct experience when I was uh, smuggling Bibles into uh, behind the Iron Curtain back in the bad old days. I, I, I've seen my own eyes what Marxism looks like, and, and the history is just horrible. But Marxism would not have existed without the Industrial Revolution and the abuses. Marx and Engels are in England at this time. They're in London. They're looking at the same things that Charles Dickens is describing, and they're saying, this has got to stop. And their answer to this was Marxism. And, and Marxism is a very powerful idea, and at one point it, it nearly destroyed the world. And it may still, it's still out there. It's taken a big hit because it didn't work out. Uh, Marx had this, this idea that history uh, traveled along these, these predictable lines, and that everybody had to go through a communist revolution and then you would enter into some sort of, of paradise where everything was great and it never happened. And these cultures that went hardcore Marxist never reaped the benefits that Marx promised, which is one of the reasons that it finally all fell apart. Um, but I want to point out one aspect of Marxism that I think is particularly pernicious. And it's not just Marxist, like many of the things we talk about. These are, this, this tendency is a human tendency. And you can see it in other ideas and, uh, and, and in religions and in philosophies. Um, and it's, it's this. Um, Marx was a materialist. And many materialists um, disbelieve uh, the, the uh, concept of free will. So what a, what a dialectical materialist will say is that the universe, there is no spirit, there is no mind. All these things that we think of as invisible forces, right? Even our minds, even the thoughts, our inner emotions, these things that we, that none of this has any reality beyond the physical. And everything is linked together by a chain of causation. So, so one of the things that this idea does is it looks at the, the issue of of uh, dependence on previous um, states, um, the, the chain of causation that goes backwards in anything, right? Every single thing in the universe had something that happened before it, or it wouldn't exist. Uh, you can trace, if you, if you had the power, you could trace back the atoms in, in the desk you're sitting at um, all the way back to the beginning of the universe. Everything is dependent on some kind of former cause. And uh, so for, for a dialectical materialist, you only appear to be making decisions. You're, but what you're doing, you're simply, uh, you're simply carrying out the end of this very complex chain of physical uh, reactions, physical things. Uh, and the things like the mind and free will uh, and spirit are nothing but illusions. Uh, now, uh, materialists are usually also behaviorists for that reason. And behaviorism is the idea that uh, our psychology and our personalities are determined by our physical circumstances. And this idea uh, still has a lot of traction, uh, but it was, it was very prevalent when I first went to college. Uh, B.F. Skinner was the uh, most um, prominent proponent of that idea. And he was the guy who first did the work on operant conditioning. And so he would do this with animals, test with animals, 
and say, you know, if I show the dog a steak, it's, it salivates, or I ring a bell, right? And then after a while, if I ring the bell, the dog will salivate <laughs> because he's associated the bell with the, with the steak. It's a basic behaviorist experiment. And uh, what, what uh, Skinner said was that human beings are just more complex dogs. Um, if I have the scientific knowledge and ability, give me enough power, give me enough uh, 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 of, of scientific knowledge of these physical causes, uh, I can turn a person into anything I want to. Let me, if I can just uh, manipulate a person's environment with operant conditioning, I can create anything from a mass murderer to a saint uh, because I can manipulate their environment. Um, this idea has a very vital flaw to it. And the flaw is that even the experimenter, right, B.F. Skinner himself, he's also, uh, according to his own theory, simply the result of a chain of causation. And so how can he say that his thoughts about the universe are valid? He's not thinking. He's just reacting. <laughs> That problem seems to never have occurred to B.F. Skinner, um, nor did it occur to Marx. Um, and it's a basic fundamental flaw, and I think the inability to see that uh, um, displays a kind, of, a kind of, of brokenness in this whole line of reasoning, uh, but you see it in a lot of other places. And what I call this is free will for everyone but, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, determinism for everyone but me. Everyone, everyone else, all the people I'm talking, especially my enemies, they are conditioned to behave the way they behave. But I'm not. Um, you see this in in the men's rights movement, right? And it, what you'll see over and over again in in these these misogynistic uh, uh, diatribes you can find online against women is that's just the way women are. They've been conditioned to be this way by our culture. and by So you can't reason with them. You can't talk to them. Uh, there's a whole group called men going their own way. And they're like, we just put them over there. We can't deal with them because that's the way they are. Without ever thinking for one second, maybe that's the way I'm the way I am. Right? Um, uh, determinism for them, but not for me. Um, you can see it on the other side of that debate in radical feminism. The patriarchy is determined. They are conditioned to behave in this way. You can't reason with them. Um, that's the way they are. Well, Marx was definitely thinking that way. And that's why his, his, the implementation of his idea has always been with violence. For Marx, Marx was not interested one bit in converting a capitalist into communism. They can't. They are what they are because of these, this, this chain of causation. Uh, they are what they are because of the culture they've come up in and the, the forces, uh, the, the, uh, the um, impersonal forces of history that have, that have driven them into this place. The answer is kill them. And Marxism went about doing that. Everywhere it's ever taken hold it has been a place of mass murder. Um, and even when uh, the Soviet Union was at the height of its power, when, when communism had taken over that whole part of the world, they had periodic purges where they would basically bring people in, round them up, and give them a test. Are you a good you know, communist, or are you, are you one of these capitalists? Have you snuck through our net? And if you couldn't prove that you were a, a real communist, one of, the, one of the workers, they'd kill you. Um, in uh, Cambodia, uh, in Pop Hole's uh, revolution, uh, they killed everyone with glasses. So wearing these would be a death sentence because workers don't need glasses. They're working with their hands. If you have glasses, that means you're, you're one of the capitalists. You're one of the, one of the elites that we have to get rid of. Um, and uh, I've also mentioned many times in class this tendency to divide that bad ideas have. And, and certainly Marxism does that. It says it divides people up between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Uh, proletari the word proletarian is a Latin word that comes from ancient Rome. Your proletarians in Latin in ancient Rome days were the lowest level of worker, the lowest level. They're just one step above a slave in, uh, in Roman culture. Um, 
And, and the communist revolution, for Marx, these are the good guys, the workers. He's saying, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. And the bourgeoisie, uh, that's a French word, which means inhabited castle or defended castle. Um, and that word is used in Marxist ideology to refer to the people who own stuff, the people who are the enemies, the capitalists, the owners. Um, and for Marx, it was this war. He wanted a war between the working class and these other folks. And it was going to be violence. But what was he looking at, right? He was looking at children as young as five years old being stuffed down chimneys until they died in order to keep the factories running. That was happening on a daily basis in England when he was there. Um, um, the uh, abuses were criminal and horrific. Your, your, uh, your average chimney sweeper his lifespan was about four years, and all the chimney sweepers were small children. They liked the chimney sweepers to be as, as young as possible, because the smaller the child is, the smaller of a chimney they can fit into. And they were literally just lowering these children, um, toddlers, into these chimneys that had been choked up with coal dust, and having them clean out the chimneys until they died of black lung. Um, this will ruin Mary Poppins for you, right? The happy chimney sweepers skipping along and singing. It's not the way that worked. Um, and, and so the horror that was Marxism arises out of the horror that was capitalism in that time. And um, the horror of capitalism arose out of the wreck of Christendom. Uh, now, the reformers didn't see this coming, right? They didn't. They didn't, weren't taking that long of a view. They didn't say, hey, let's get rid of the authority of the Catholic Church for all these things, for all of you. So they, they had a point. Um, but they did not see this coming, that the problem of slavery would arise again. And of course, in our country, we solved that problem by having slaves again, and then and then fought the bloodiest war in, human, in, in American history. And up to that point in history, the battles of the Civil War were the bloodiest in world history. The casualty rates in the Civil War were magnitudes higher than the wars that came before because of the technology, to some degree. Uh, where rifles and Gatling guns eventually, and and <laughs> um, you know these these uh, battlefields were just incredibly uh, bloody, um, and so. Uh, what I, want to, what I want to point out here is, is what happens if we can take a long view of history and we say, well, what caused this? Where did this come from? Because we can focus on the, the problems of capitalism and the problems of Marxism and communism, but we got to know what came before, what led things to this place. And uh, the Protestant Reformation is one of the things that leads to the Marxist revolutions that swept the world in the early part of the 20th century and accounted for several many, many, many million people dying of violence. Um, now the artists of this time uh, lined up along these divides and many of the, uh, of the biggest movers and shakers in the art world were lining up behind the Marxist ideas to some degree and they were definitely uh, lining up behind uh, uh, materialistic ideas. And you see this character show up for the first time, the uh, hateful artist, uh, um, the artist whose job is to offend the bourgeoisie. They saw their 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 uh, one of the things about the bourgeoisie, one of the ways that the, that the bourgeoisie was defined was uh, very shallow, very. Uh, uh, their conventional morality, their their uh, materialism, right, um, was held in contempt by people on the other side, and um, artists began to see their duty to to shock these people once again, not to convert them. If you're a hardcore Marxist, or not all these people were hardcore Marxists, but the idea is, like, I don't, I'm not going to make them side with me. I hate them, and they can't change. So my art's just going to hurt them. Art intended to to damage people psychologically your book has some of it in it um, in the dealing uh, chapter on Christianity there's the um, 
image of the Virgin Mary shot through a glass full of urine. Uh, the artist put the image of Mary into a glass filled with his own urine and took a picture of it. Uh, I'm blanking on the guy's name. He's been doing this forever. Um, uh, that was intended to hurt me, okay, just because I'm Roman Catholic and, and for me, uh, uh, the thoughts I have about Mary are some of the most tender and uh, important um, aspects of my personality and, and who I am as a human being. And that um, uh, artwork uh, was intended to injure me, right? Um, what did the artist want to happen there? Um, is, is he really trying to convince me that Mary is something I shouldn't be, I shouldn't find important? No. That's not how you go about arguing with someone or trying to convince someone. Uh, the intent was to offend. And um, it worked, right? Well, that's, that, that person begins to exist at this time. Uh, in France, they call these guys flaneur. Um, and um, we still have them with us, right? The Flaneur was a guy who, who basically was a, uh, the, the personality of Flaneur is someone who's aloof and above it all. Someone who isn't going to be uh, uh, caught up in the uh, um, concerns of the, of the bourgeoisie and their, and their outdated morality and their shallow materialism. I'm above all of this and I am an artist and I have sensibilities that other people don't have. Um, hipsters in our own time are a direct descendant of that. Uh, the Flaneurs were their great-great-grandfathers, right? They, they walk around uh, in their refined understanding of art that no one else gets, right? Um, uh, Andy Warhol in the 70s and early 80s, Warhol died, yeah. Uh, he, he, you know, his, his, the whole persona of him as the aloof artist who's above it all and no one can understand me and um, uh, that, that comes out of this, this time. You can tell I don't have much patience for these people, I'm sorry. Um, uh, there is a place, right? There is there's tr there's some truth to the idea that uh, some artists see things more clearly and, and feel things more deeply and, and that's a painful place to be and it can cause people to be uh, cut off from folks around them for no fault of their own. Um, uh, but the flaneur, the, you also have your poser, right? You're a person who's, who's uh, putting on this, this attitude uh, and whose intention is to offend and to um, inflict pain on their audience. Um, and uh, uh, if you want to see an example of this, look at... Um, uh, I may put this on your on your supplemental material. I, I may not. I don't I, I like working here. I don't want to get into much trouble. Um, uh, look up uh, Dave Chappelle's uh, Charlie Murphy's True Hollywood Stories. Uh, it's on YouTube. Um, it's Charlie Murphy, who's the brother of Eddie Murphy, and he tells this story about uh, playing basketball against Prince and his crew, uh, and it's hilarious. Uh, but the the attitude that Prince portrays in that uh, is that of the flaneur. Uh, he's, he's floating around these social situations and he's above it all and, and apart from it all because he's an artist. And he says, this bores me. Does anyone want to play basketball? <laughs> right? that's, that, that's that attitude. And, and in this time uh, of the Industrial Revolution and the rise of Marxism and the, the attitude of artists towards their audience, uh, it begins here. And once again, carries on to our own own day. I call this art against everyone, um, or at least art against the people that I don't like. Um, so that's that. Um, I'll keep throwing up discussion questions. Hopefully we're in a rhythm now. We can keep going here. Remember, I've pushed the due date back for the test um, another week because we're not ready to do it yet. Um, and we will soldier on, uh, stay uh, healthy and stay safe.